and dignitaries have arrived, so kindly give them a standing ovation. to everyone to kindly rise for the same. life. Cardinal Parikatal had been an administrator with far-sightedness, a theologian with an Indian outlook, a pastor with a humble heart, a man of vision, and an ardent missionary of love and service. So as part of paying homage to the Cardinal, let's watch a short documentary composed in his honor. ജന്മം കൊണ്ട് ഭാരതീയനും സംസ്കാരം കൊണ്ട് ഹൈന്ദവനും വിശ്വാസം കൊണ്ട് ക്രൈസ്തവനുമായിരുന്ന ഒരാൾ കേരളത്തെ നവോത്ഥാന കാലത്തേക്ക് കൈപിടിച്ചു നടത്തിയവരിൽ മുൻനിരക്കാരൻ കർദിനാൾ മാർ ജോസഫ് പാറേക്കാട്ടിൽ കാലം ചെയ്തിട്ട് മൂന്ന് പതിറ്റാണ്ടുകൾ പൂർത്തിയാകുന്നു അദ്വൈതത്തിന്റെ പ്രേക്ഷിതനായി ആദിശങ്കരൻ ഭാരത പര്യടനത്തിനിറങ്ങിയ അതേ മണ്ണിൽ കാലടിക്ക് സമീപമുള്ള കിടങ്ങൂർ ഗ്രാമം ഈ ഭാരതീയ ഗുരുനാഥനും ജന്മം നൽകിയെന്നതും ചരിത്രത്തിലെ യാദർശികതയാകാം ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി പന്ത്രണ്ട് ഏപ്രിൽ ഒന്നാം തീയതി പാറേക്കാട്ടി കുടുംബത്തിലെ ഇട്ടീരയുടെയും ഭാര്യ ഏലീശയുടെയും മൂന്നാമത്തെ മകനായി ജനനം ദൈവമാർഗത്തിലുള്ള സഞ്ചാരം ജോസഫ് എന്ന യുവാവിനെ പഴയ സിലോണിലെ കാൻഡി സെമിനാരിയിൽ എത്തിച്ചു ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി മുപ്പത്തി ഒൻപത് ആഗസ്റ്റ് ഇരുപത്തിനാലിന് വൈദിക പട്ടം തുടർന്ന് വലിയ നിയോഗങ്ങൾ കാത്തുവച്ചിരുന്ന കേരളത്തിന്റെ മണ്ണിലേക്ക് ക്രിസ്തുവിനെ ഉള്ളിൽ സ്വീകരിച്ച ഒരാൾ ചുറ്റുമുള്ളവരുടെ കണ്ണീരിന്റെ കാരണങ്ങൾ തേടാതിരിക്കുന്നത് എങ്ങനെ കടലിനഭിമുഖമായി മാത്രമല്ല കടലോളം കരുതലുമായി തന്നെയാണ് പിതാവ് ഇവിടെ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നത് ആ കാലഘട്ടത്തില് കേരളത്തിൽ വളരെയേറെ കുഷ് രോഗികൾ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു കൊരട്ടിയിലുള്ള ഗവൺമെൻറ് ഗുരുട്ട കുഷ്ഠ രോഗാശുപത്രിയിൽ അറുന്നൂറിലധികം രോഗികൾ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്ന ഒരു കാലമാണത് പിതാവ് അവിടെ ഒരു നിത്യ സന്ദർശകനായിരുന്നു എന്ന കാര്യവും പലർക്കും അറിഞ്ഞുകൂടാ അവർക്ക് വേണ്ടി പല കാര്യങ്ങളും പിതാവ് ചെയ്യുമായിരുന്നു ആ കുഷ് രോഗികൾ എറണാകുളത്ത് ആഴ്ചയിൽ ഒരിക്കൽ വിഷാടനത്തിന് വരുമ്പോൾ അവർ മെത്രാപ്പോലത്തെ കാണാൻ കർദ്ദനാൾ പിതാവിനെ കാണാൻ വേണ്ടി അർബനയുടെ മുമ്പിൽ വരാറുണ്ട് ഒരിക്കൽ ഞാൻ ഓർക്കുക ഒരു കുഷ് രോഗി തനിക്ക് ഷൂസ് തൻ്റെ ഷൂസ് കേടുവന്നു എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ ഒരു പുതിയ ഷൂസ് വേണം എന്നാവശ്യപ്പെട്ടപ്പോൾ പിതാവ് പറഞ്ഞു അടുത്ത ആഴ്ച നിങ്ങൾ വരുമ്പോൾ അത് ഞാൻ തരപ്പെടുത്തി തരാം 
പിറ്റേ ആഴ്ചയിൽ പത്തറുപത് കുഷ്രോഗികൾ വന്നപ്പോൾ ബാറ്റ കമ്പനിയിൽ നിന്ന് അറുപത് പേർക്കും ഷൂസ് വാങ്ങി കൊടുത്ത രംഗം കേരളത്തിൻ്റെ സാമൂഹ്യ രാഷ്ട്രീയ ചരിത്രം ഉരുവം കൊണ്ട അൻപതുകളിലും അറുപതുകളിലും ആ ചരിത്രത്തിനൊപ്പം പാറേക്കാട്ടിൽ പിതാവും വളർന്നു ഈ നാടിൻ്റെ സ്പന്ദനങ്ങളെ തൊട്ടറിഞ്ഞ് നാട്ടുകാരുടെ ആശാഭിലാഷങ്ങൾക്ക് ആത്മീയതയുടെ പുതുചേതന പകർന്ന് പിതാവ് നിറയുന്ന കാഴ്ചയാണ് കേരളം കണ്ടത് ആദ്യത്തെ ഒരു കർദ്ദിനാളം നിലയിൽ അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് വലിയ ഒരു സ്ഥാനം സമൂഹം കൽപ്പിച്ചിരളി അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് മലയാള മനോരമ കേരളത്തിലെ നൂറ് സാമൂഹ്യ പരിഷ്കർത്താക്കളെ പറ്റിയുള്ള ഒരു രേഖ ഇറക്കിയപ്പോൾ ഈ നൂറ് പേരിൽ ഒന്നാമൻ ശ്രീനാരായണ ഗുരുവായിരുന്നു ആ ശ്രീനാരായണ ഗുരുവിനോടൊപ്പം നൂറ് പേരിൽ ഒരാളായിട്ട് കർദ്ദിനാൾ പാറേക്കാട്ടിലിനെ മനോരമ തിരഞ്ഞെടുക്കുകയുണ്ടായി അത് ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി അറുപത്തൊമ്പതിൽ അദ്ദേഹം കർദ്ദിനാളായതിന് ശേഷമാണ് പൗരസ്ത്യ ലോകത്തെ ഏറ്റവും തലപ്പൊക്കമുള്ള ആത്മീയ സാന്നിധ്യമായി പിതാവ് മാറിയതോടെ ആഗോള ക്രിസ്തീയ സമൂഹത്തിന്റെ നിർണായക വേദികൾ അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് കാതോർത്തു മാർപ്പാപ്പമാരായി ജോൺ പോൾ ഒന്നാമനെയും രണ്ടാമനെയും തെരഞ്ഞെടുത്ത കോൺക്ലേവുകളിൽ അംഗമായിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹം അഞ്ച് മാർപ്പാപ്പമാരോടൊപ്പം പ്രവർത്തിക്കാൻ ഭാഗ്യം ലഭിച്ച പിതാവ് ചരിത്രത്തിൽ തങ്കലിപികളിൽ രേഖപ്പെടുത്തപ്പെട്ട രണ്ടാം വത്തിക്കാൻ സുനഹദോസിൽ ആദ്യ അവസാനം പങ്കെടുത്തു കേരളത്തിന്റെ ഈ ആദ്യ കർദ്ദിനാൾ ലോകവാതായനങ്ങൾ ഒന്നൊന്നായി തുറക്കുകയായിരുന്നു ഭാരതീയ ക്രിസ്തീയ ജീവിതത്തിന്റെ ഊടും പാവും മാറ്റുന്ന പ്രവൃത്തികളിലൂടെ ക്രിസ്ത്യാനിയുടെ ജീവിതാന്തരീക്ഷത്തെ തന്നെ അദ്ദേഹം മാറ്റിപ്പണിതു എന്റെ കുട്ടിക്കാലം മുതൽക്ക് തന്നെ മാർ ജോസഫ് പാറക്കാട്ടിൽ തിരുമേനിയുടെ പേര് നിരന്തരമായി പത്രങ്ങളിലും മറ്റ് മാധ്യമങ്ങളിലും ഒക്കെ വന്നിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹം ഒരു ക്രൈസ്തവ മത മേലദക്ഷിണ നിലകൾ ഉപരിയൊരു നവോത്ഥാന നായകനായിട്ട് ആണ് അദ്ദേഹത്തെ ചരിത്രം രേഖപ്പെടുത്തുക നിയമിയായി സഭയെ സംബന്ധിച്ചോളം സഭയുടെ ഭാരതവൽക്കരണത്തിന് തുടക്കം കുറിച്ചത് പാറക്കാട്ടിൽ പിതാവായിരുന്നു ജനിച്ചു ജീവിക്കുന്ന മണ്ണിലേക്ക് ആഴത്തിൽ വേരോടിയ സംസ്കാരത്തിന്റെ തനിമകളെയും ചേർത്ത് പിടിച്ച് സ്വർഗരാജ്യത്തിലേക്ക് പ്രവേശിക്കാമെന്നതായിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹത്തിന്റെ കാഴ്ചപ്പാട് പിതാവിന്റെ ആ രീതിയിലുള്ള അതിൽ ഒരേ രീതി ആ രീതിയിൽ കണ്ടുകൊണ്ട് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് തുടർന്നു കൊണ്ടുപോകണമെന്ന് ഭയങ്കര ആഗ്രഹമുണ്ട് അതിനു വേണ്ടിയിട്ടാണ് ഞങ്ങളെല്ലാം ശ്രമിച്ചുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നത് പിതാവ് അന്ന് ജീവിച്ചിരിക്കുന്ന സമയത്ത് തന്നെ പറഞ്ഞിരിക്കുന്ന റൂമുണ്ട് പിതാവ് ഉള്ള ജീവിച്ചിരിക്കുന്ന സമയത്ത് തന്നെ പറഞ്ഞ് ഞങ്ങൾ അതിൽ ആ റൂമ് കീപ്പ് ചെയ്യണമെന്ന് പറഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ട് അതുപോലെ തന്നെ ഞങ്ങൾ ഏറ്റവും ഭംഗിയായിട്ട് ഞങ്ങളെയും കൊണ്ട് ചെയ്യാവുന്ന രീതിയിൽ ഏറ്റവും ഭംഗിയായിട്ട് തന്നെ ഞങ്ങൾ റൂമ് കീപ്പ് ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുകയാണ് അര നൂറ്റാണ്ട് നീണ്ടു നിന്ന ആ പ്രേക്ഷിത ജീവിതം നന്മയുടെ നിരവധി അടയാളങ്ങളായി ഇന്നും തലയുയർത്തി നിൽക്കുന്നു
Very Reverend Dr. Wargis Patakil, Vicar General of Angamali, Ernagulam Angamali Archdiocese, and the President of the meeting, Sri Mondek Singh Alwalia, former Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Government of India, and our distinguished guest, Reverend Dr. Abraham Oliapurath, the Manager of Bharat Madha College, Reverend Father Jimmy Chankarthano, our Assistant Manager, Dr. Lissi Kachapuli and Ms. Bini Rani Jose, Vice Principals of the College, Dr. Punni Joseph, Head of the Department of Commerce and the Coordinator of the Program, Distinguished Guests, Dear Former and Present Faculty Members, Staff and Students, Ladies and Gentlemen, a warm good morning and namaskaram to all of you. I am really delighted to stand before you on this auspicious occasion when we have the 20th Cardinal Joseph Parekatil Memorial Lecture. Today we have come together to commemorate the vision and legacy of a great visionary, our founder, Cardinal Joseph Parekatil, the first Cardinal of Kerala. As we reflect on the journey of Bharat Madha College, which Cardinal Joseph Parekatil established in 1965 as a center for higher learning for the economically deprived, socially downtrodden, and educationally disadvantaged people of Trikakara and its rural community, which comprised a majority of Muslims, some Christians, and Dalits, we are reminded of the profound impact Cardinal Joseph Parekatil had on the educational landscape of Kerala. It is his commitment to knowledge, wisdom, and service that laid the foundation for this institution that has flourished and grown into a beacon of academic excellence over the past 60 years. So when we have this lecture today, we celebrate our roots, acknowledge our journey, and look forward to the future with a renewed vigor and purpose. We know that the world is evolving, and we are living in a globalized, technology-driven world where we talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data and computation, networking automation, etc., which transform not only our education and work, but even our human relations. India is a big player in this transformation. However, we know that Kerala has been facing a serious crisis in higher education for the past several years due to its inability to modernize its education, inability to upskill the youth, inability to generate employment, failure to provide academic autonomy to higher education institutions for experimentation, and politicization of academics and academic institutions. So it is imperative that we, as an academic community, adapt and innovate, remaining true to the vision and mission that define our institution, which is academic excellence, through our service and commitment to God and to the nation. The values instilled by Cardinal Joseph Parekatil of knowledge, compassion, service, and inclusivity continue to guide us in our pursuit of excellence. With these words of introduction, let me now enter into my responsibility of welcoming each one of you. Very Reverend Dr. Vargis Patakil, who is presiding over this meeting, is the Vicar General of Ernagulam Angamali Diocese. A great visionary leader, he has been giving all support to this institution in its march forward. As the governing body member of the institution, he played a pivotal role in getting autonomy into our institution. Father, on behalf of everyone present here, I, with lots of love and respect, I welcome you to this gathering. <laughs> it is indeed a matter of great honor for us to have with us today a distinguished personality one of the key architects of India's economic reforms in the 1990s, Sri Mondek Singh Aluwalia, as our esteemed chief guest. His contributions to the introduction of globalization in India have not only reshaped our nation's economic trajectory, 
but have also influenced the global discourse on development. I believe that all the developments that we claim today for India, like India becoming a superpower in 2030, a developed nation in 2047, third biggest economy in near future, all depend upon the judicious implementation of globalization in the 1990s. And I emphasize on the word judicious implementation of globalization. Sir, we are extremely grateful to you for having you here. And with all respect and love, on behalf of the management, Bharat Mada College, and everyone who is present here, I welcome you to Bharat Mada College and to this lecture. I would like to welcome Reverend Dr. Abraham Oliyapurath, our manager, and Reverend Father Jimmy Chan Karthanam together to this meeting, because supporting and complementing each other, they have developed a great camaraderie and companionship on the campus among the management, faculty, staff, and students. Always available, approachable, and transparent, they have redefined management and leadership. They also have led this institution to unprecedentedly greater heights during the last three years in terms of NIRF ranking and other rankings, research development, university results and ranks, and finally making this institution autonomous. With lots of love and respect, I welcome our manager, Reverend Dr. Abraham Oliyaparath, and assistant manager, Father Jimmy Shankarthanam, to this meeting. I take this opportunity to offer a very cordial welcome to our Vice Principals, Dr. Lisi Kachapuli and Ms. Bini Rani Jus, who give efficient leadership to all the curricular and co-curricular activities of the institution. Welcome, Dr. Lisi Kachapuli and Ms. Bini Rani Jus. I welcome Dr. Puni Joseph, who is the head of the Department of Commerce and the coordinator of this program. This program is, in fact, coordinated by the Department of Com Commerce. And it is Dr. Puni's leadership and minute planning that makes this program beautiful. Welcome, Dr. Puni. We have our invited distinguished guests from different domains of life who have been closely associated with the life and activities of the institution. We seek your continued support and encouragement and welcome each one of you to this lecture. We have our former faculty members, our gurus, who have shown the path of commitment and dedication. With a due respect and love, I welcome each one of you to this lecture. I welcome in a special way our 2023 passed out students who proved their mettle in academics as well as in curricular activities, their parents, and the faculty members who made great, great achievements during the last academic year. We have our friends from media here who have always been of great support and who were instrumental in taking the extension and outreach activities of the institution to the larger community outside. I offer you a very cordial welcome to BMC. I also take this opportunity to welcome our faculty members, staff, and students who are the actual organizers of this program. So formality's sake, I welcome you to this gathering. Once again, a very warm welcome to our chief guest, Sri Montek Singh Alualia, all our guests and participants. Let us, this, let us make this day memorable and enriching experience for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And on behalf of everyone gathered here, I extend a very cordial welcome to Dr. Johnson KM, our principal. Welcome, sir. And now, let's invoke the positive energy through the symbolic and traditional gesture of lighting the lamp. I request the dignitaries to kindly move forward and inaugurate the event by lighting the lamp.
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Dear Reverend Doctor, Father Abraham Oliyapurat, Manager BMC, our respected Montek Singh Aluwalia Sir, the Speaker of the Day, Reverend Father Jimmy Chen Karthanam, Assistant Manager BMC, Professor Sri Johnson KM Principal, Dr. Lissi Khachapuli, Mrs. Rani, Bini Rani Jose, Vice Principals, Dr. Mrs. Ponni Joseph, convener of the program, Reverend Fathers, Sisters, Faculties, Students, all the dignitaries, and dear friends. A warm good morning to all of you. I am very happy to participate in this lecture series honoring the legendary personality, our late Cardinal Joseph Parekatil. Moreover, the presence of Sri Montek Singh Aluwalia, former Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of Government of India, as a speaker of the day, makes this a unique event. He has seen India and her needs in its magnitude and intensity, and is an apt person to enlighten us on today's topic. His insights will be a powerful tool for further intellectual reflections, and of course, for action which we have to take in the future. Joseph Cardinal Parekatil is a well-known name, and he is a great son of the Sierra Malabar Church, and dearly loved by all the people of Ernagulam Angamali Archdiocese, and moreover, uh, I would say, of Kerala, and all the people here in the south and north. And he is always remembered with sentiments of gratitude and respect. The influence which he had in the community, the impact which he has made through his life is remarkable. Even today, we are feeling his powerful presence in our community through his vision, through his uh, the commitments he has made and the light which he has shown. He was an iconic figure of the past who has shaped our present and will shed light on the future. In this context, I am reminded of the famous expression with which Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru communicated the death of Gandhiji to the world over the radio. He said, I quote, friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere. Our beloved leader, Bapu, as we call him, the father of the nation, is no more. We will not run to him for advice and seek solace from him. And that is a terrible blow, not to me only, but to millions and millions of this country. I feel that this sentiment expressed by the first Prime Minister of India is true in our context, in the case of Joseph Cardinal Parekatil. The light is gone, but we will not let the darkness or any other force overpower us in any way. Rather, the path that he has shown, the concerns he lived, and the initiatives he has taken are in front of us as reservoir of strength and inspiration. To capture this great personality in a single linguistic framework is indeed a difficult task. The best word that can do at least partial justice to this person, I believe, is prophet. With prophetic insight and the courage of conviction, he dialogued with the people of his time, took culture seriously, and addressed the challenges as a true Indian. He showed the way, lighted the way, walked the way with conviction, and invited all to join him. Being front-runner and trendsetter in many fields, he created history and wide opened a new horizon of perspectives that shaped the future of the church and society as well. Cardinal Parekardil could easily read the threads that weaved the fabric of society. Ne neither did he lament the fate of the people, nor did he stop 
stop short of ardent attempts at improving their life. I believe that he identified himself with them and did everything possible to shape the destiny of his people, embarking upon new adventurous endeavors that contributed greatly to the church as well as to society at large. In short, we could say with conviction that he was a social reformer. Education, healthcare, innovative social work, etc., were the areas of his special interest. Quality education, better healthcare facilities made available to all, especially to the poor, and financial supports to the marginalized through special works, special social works especially, changed and revolutionized the face of the society in which he lived. With immense joy and gratitude, I recall that this autonomous college too is the brainchild of his farsightedness. Steps taken to empower women, openness towards all cultures and other religions, promotion of religious harmony, secularism and etc. were landmarks of his ministry. Enormous contributions were made in various fields to the church as well as to society and that the, all these contributions made by Cardinal are treasured even today and will always be a source of inspiration for many in the years to come. Wherever we go in the Archdiocese, we hear the word, name of Cardinal Joseph Parekatil always coming again and again from the mouth of everyone. Such was the impact that he made in our society because he could live with the people he could share their ideas and he was a servant of love who made all efforts to see the upliftment of the poor people of the community. And his presence is felt everywhere, whether it be an education field, healthcare sector, or social movements, we can see his imprints clearly in every sector. So such a person, of iconic image still lives in our heart. And this 20th commemorate lecture is a fitting homage to the great legend of our church. The topic selected for the lecture, challenges ahead for India, is an elusive, complex, and multifaceted concept. Indian society has undergone transformation and advancement in diverse fields. This has led to the formation of a composite society with various socio-cultural issues that need to be tackled. Advancement in information technology, an unimaginable leap in communication in the modern world have made us all part of the global society. Consequently, the developments all over the world have become like our next door developments. To catch up with them or to excel them, we should have dreams and projects, at least as big as or better, bigger than the global ones. Of course, bigger dreams mean bigger challenges, and we are the people to take up that challenge, especially as an academic group. Identifying and facing the challenges are the constituent part of making qualitative leap in development. Indian society has made has the innate strength on which it can rely to meet all future challenges. Today, we are trying to have a glimpse of the challenges that piled up in our society to equip ourselves to contribute to the nation building with the help of Montek Singh Aluwalia sir. He is an expert in the field with his vast experience as former deputy chairman of the planning commission of the government of India. Through the insightful reflection and deliberation that follows, let our autonomous college and each one of us join hands in building up our nation. I also like to put on record my sincere gratitude to the management and the faculties and students and all, the, all those who work behind the curtain to make this day a reality. Let us keep alive 
the memory of Joseph Cardinal Parakatil and keep his vision forward and we are the ones to work for it. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal Parikatil was, and how the reflection of that greatness still prevails. Our manager, Reverend Dr. Abraham Oliapurath, has always led the institution with, it, with his proficient organizational skill, problem-solving aptitude, and commitment to fostering a positive learning environment. Dear Father, I invite you to address the guest. Former Deputy Chairman, Planning Commission, Government of India. My Reverend Father, Dr. Vargis Patekil, our Vicar General, Dr. Kayem Johnson, our Principal, Father Jimmy Chankartanam, our Assistant Manager, our Vice Principals, Binimis and Dr. Lissimis, and our Coordinator, Dr. Punni Miss, and all the faculty members, teaching and non-teaching staff, and all the guests and the participants and all the parents who have come here with their students who have been awarded as the best students of BMC. And I think uh, already our, in the presidential address, uh, it's uh, elaborately given the message about our uh, Cardinal Joseph Pare Cartel, and I will be giving you some message about the Joseph Cardinal Pare Cartel in concise way. We gather today on the sacred occasion of commemorating the life and legacy of true shepherd of the flock, Cardinal Joseph Pare Cartel. As we stand in the shadow of this towering presence, let our hearts be filled not only with solemn remembrance but with a vibrant gratitude for the light he cast upon our lives and our nation. Cardinal Parekadil was a man of many facets, a devoted bishop, a fearless defender of the faith, a champion of the underprivileged, and a tireless advocate for interfaith harmony. His journey from the humble beginnings of a small village to the pinnacle of the Catholic Church, especially the Archbishop and Cardinal of Ernakulam Archdiocese, is a testament to the power of faith, resilience, and unwavering dedication to God and his people. He championed the cause of the marginalized, extending a hand of solace to the downtrodden and the forgotten. His voice, infused with the conviction of righteousness, resonated against tyranny and opposition. He fought for the education of girls, for the upliftment of the underprivileged, and for the harmonious coexistence of diverse communities. He understood perhaps better the most that true faith translates not just in pious pronouncements, but in the tangible lacks of mercy, and social responsibility. His legacy extends far beyond the borders of Kerala, embracing the vast expanse of our nation and reaching the shores of the world. He was a tireless ambassador of interfaith dialogue, building bridges of understanding between religious and cultures. His gentle diplomacy, coupled with his unwavering commitment to shared values, earned him the respect and admiration of leaders across the world. Today, as we stand at the crossroads of time, his message resonates with ever-increasing urgency. We face a world riddled with divisions where intolerance threatens to eclipse the common ground of humanity in such a climate, Cardinal Parekhatil's life stands as a testament to the transformative power of love, empathy, and unwavering faith in the inherent goodness of humankind. Let us therefore honor his memory not just through words, but through action. Let us emulate his courage, his compassion, and his unwavering commitment to the principles he held dear. Let us strive to create a world where the echoes of his message resonate in every heart 
where walls crumple and bridges are built, where differences are celebrated and unity is our guiding star. May the spirit of Cardinal Joseph Parekhatel continue to inspire us. May his legacy continue to guide us and may his light continue to illuminate our path towards a brighter and more hopeful future. Thank you. And now, before moving on to the keynote, let me take this opportunity to introduce the honorable keynote speaker of the day. Honorable Montek Singh Aluwalia served as the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of India from July 2004 till May 2014. This was an appointment at the Cabinet Minister level and Mr. Aluwalia was a special invitee to the Cabinet and several Cabinet committees. He has held several positions including the Chief of the Income Distribution Division at the World Bank and has been a key figure in India's economic reforms from the mid-1980s onwards. He was awarded the prestigious Padma Vibhushan, India's second highest civilian honor by the President of India in 2011 for his outstanding contribution to economic policy and public service. Mr. Aluwalia received a B Honours degree from St. Stephen's College, Delhi University and went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, from where he received MA and MPhil degrees in economics. He has received several honorary doctorates, including the Doctor of Civil Law from Oxford University. He holds the position of Distinguished Fellow at the Center for Social and Economic Progress a Delhi-based think tank. In June 2021, he was named for the high-level advisory group formed jointly by IMF and World Bank. And I deem it as a privilege to welcome Honorable Mondik Singh Aluwalia for the keynote address. Sir, please. Reverend Father Dr. Varghese Potakal, Reverend Father Dr. Abraham Oliapurath, Professor Dr. Johnson, other distinguished dignitaries on the dais, uh, ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, uh, and others. Well, first of all, let me say that it's a great honor to be invited to deliver this lecture. You know, I was very impressed by the account of Cardinal Parikatil, which we got from that small uh, film. And you know, it's interesting, I had of course read up, that's what everybody do does these days. Whenever you don't know something, you go to Wikipedia. And this is a good example of why Wikipedia is not particularly a good source. Because, you know, I was surprised that it, it, of course, it listed all the ecclesiastical achievements of the cardinal going up the hierarchy. But it said nothing about the two things that I thought were really quite remarkable. One is the concern for the, those left out, those more disadvantaged, setting up orphanages, that kind of thing. And it made no reference at all to his quite remarkable contribution, as the film put it, Indianizing the church. And I would earnestly request that in his memory, the best thing that Bharat Mata College could do is to edit that. And one of the good things about Wikipedia is you can edit it. So I urge you to edit it and put in these things because they're really very, very important both the bringing in those left out, because a lot of the unhappiness today in how our economy is performing is that it leaves out too many people, not just ours, many economies. And of course, the whole Indianization of the church is a very, very important social phenomenon. And the fact that he did that, I think way back in the 70s, when this wasn't even an issue, I mean, nothing else demonstrates his farsightedness 
uh, than this. So my request is some of these bright young kids sitting here could pay their respects to the cardinal by editing Wikipedia appropriately. Now, you know, I've been asked to speak on the state of the economy and challenges ahead. I don't have a written speech. Usually, I accept these invitations because it's very interesting to hear the questions that young people have. You know, I have frequently said when invited to speak and I'm asked, will you take questions? And I say, of course, that's the most interesting thing. And I frequently say, why don't we reverse the sequence? Let's just get 15 questions and then I'll weave a lecture around them. I mean, I feel that's a more sensible way of proceeding because then you really are addressing what people are interested in. But I realize that that's not usually the form. So I will say a few words. And if there is an interaction, I hope you'll pick out from what I've said, things that are wrong or things that seem to you uh, to require further elaboration. So I was asked, people want to know, what is the current state of the economy? I think that's, that's where we are starting from. I'm not going to go into the past, you know, this is an election time in the country. So you will have a lot of discussions about who did better, who did worse. And I mean, the nice things about elections is that they are, they are hotly contested. You know, democracy is not wrongly called a consensual form of government. It's actually a very contested form of government. So you'll have enough uh, as the election fever mounts of good things and bad things. I'm not going to go into the past. I really want to look ahead. And all these issues will come up as we look ahead also. And the first step is the current state of the economy. Well, I would say very briefly that by most conventional indicators, the Indian economy is in reasonably good shape, particularly considering the state of the world and considering what other economies are going through. This is actually the result, in my view, of a long process of structural reform and policy reform, which began in 1991. And it has led to an economy that is able to manage itself quite well. The newspapers tell you that uh, the growth rate is now, this year, is expected to be around 7%. Others say, well, you know, these things get revised downward. But even those who take a more pessimistic view would say that it'll probably end up being six and a half. Now, you know, if you just want to know how's the economy doing right now, and you want to focus on GDP growth, the six and a half percent would be quite good. Most other countries are doing much worse, and that's why we are described as the fastest growing economy in the world, principally because the Chinese economy, which used to set the pace, has slowed down very dramatically and is not likely to recover very quickly for a variety of reasons. But I, I must emphasize that just because we grow faster than China doesn't mean we're closing the gap. The Chinese, since 1990, have been growing much faster than anyone else and certainly much faster than us. So the per capita GDP, which is a kind of a measure of the average level of living in China, is about five times that of India, four to five times, depending on how you calculate it. So if we grow a little faster, uh, I don't think that's the same thing as saying we've overtaken China. Sometimes I hear that said. But still, it is a good, it is from where we are, it's a good performance. I think you can say that the Indian economy uh, did well in managing COVID. We were very badly hit, worse than others, but we recovered fairly quickly. And right now we seem to be doing better. But that's only one dimension. I think uh, what people really want to know is, is the growth we are experiencing and also the growth we are likely to experience going to be something comparable. Now, you know, in terms of likely to experience, you have to ask yourself, what is the target that has been set? In the old days, uh, the government used to set a target for growth every five years. In the planning commission, we would do it 
every five-year plan. That is no longer being done, but there are broad indications of what is expected, although they are much longer term. I mean, for example, sometimes you hear uh, a target like a $30 trillion economy by 2047. That is the 100th year uh, of India's independence. Sometimes you hear that we should become a high-income country uh, by the 100 years. That's the uh, end of Amrit Kal, 100 years uh, of India's independence. And you, know, you can work out what is the implicit growth rate to achieve that objective. Now, that is not very easy because when you're doing $20, $30 trillion, it's not clear whether that's meant to be in constant dollar prices or in current dollar prices. And when you say high income, what is the cutoff level? I would say that probably the cutoff level, if you take the cutoff level as being today's cutoff level, which the World Bank uses to define countries between middle income and high income, that would be a per capita income of something of the order of $13,800 in present dollars, okay? And our actual income at the moment in, in dollars is about 2,700. So you're really talking about a five to six times increase uh, over a 25 year period. Uh, and if you do that in constant dollars, you'll probably come up with growth rates. The growth rate you need would be something like eight and a half percent or so in GDP because you have to allow for the fact that although population is slowing down, it's still growing, and it will keep growing until about 2050 plus. So the real question is, are we set on a growth, achieving a growth rate of say 8% a year for the next 25 years? Now you know, in order to address that question, you have to keep in mind that you know, as an economy becomes more developed, it tends to slow down. And that's what China has done, that's what virtually every economy has done, that when you're at a low level of income, you grow relatively fast. When you reach a higher level of income, in a way, if you like, the early harvest possibilities have disappeared and the growth rate begins to slow down. So, you know, if you want to achieve an 8% growth for 25 years on average, then really you ought to be aiming at maybe eight and a half, nine now, and then a slowing down to seven. So I think if you compare it by those, we haven't, we haven't seen yet whether the government is going to set such a target. I believe it was announced in the newspapers that the Niti Ayog, that's the institution which sort of replaced the Planning Commission, although it does different things. They are about to bring out a sort of Vision 2047 document. And I assume that will give a sense of what the growth rate is. I would say that, you know, uh, a growth rate of 8.5% in the next 10 years or so is not impossible, but it's not automatic. And it's not the growth rate we are currently achieving. So the real question is, uh, the challenge before us in this lecture is about challenges of the future. The challenge before us is, can we do what is necessary to increase the growth rate to something above 8.5% for the next 10 years in order to average 7.5% over the next 25 years? I think that one of the, that's one point. But you know, the debate increasingly is not just about growth. I mean, nobody in his right mind would judge an economy simply by the growth rate uh, it achieves. I mean, for the last 20 years in the Indian discussion, and in fact, even longer, we have always recognized that growth is one thing, but it's not everything. You know, the first, the first recognition that growth is not the only thing we should focus on came in Parliament when uh, I think uh, uh, Ramano Lohia, uh, a left-wing MP, uh, raised the question to Pandeji 
that you're talking about 5% growth. In those days, the 5% was thought to be a good growth rate. Uh, but, you know, who's getting the benefit of this growth? And he made the point that it's not like China, where everybody is getting the benefit of whatever growth there is. Here, the benefit is going to only a few, and large numbers of people are being excluded. Now, you know, this had not been raised in the debates until then. And Bandiji, being a very socially conscious person, set up an entire committee to examine, you know, what level of living are different people at. And then that came to the focus on what is the poverty line and the large numbers of people below it. And slowly, the growth debate got shifted into how will growth bring Indian people above the poverty line. And in the early 1960s, the Planning Commission, or mid-1960s, the Planning Commission set up a group uh, to make recommendations. And that group said that, look, uh, we are so poor in terms of income levels in those days that we cannot raise the level of income of the vast majority of the people simply by redistributing. redistributing. There isn't enough to redistribute. So we have to have higher growth. And they said that we should aim at 7% growth. This is in the mid-60s, by the way. And they said, if we do that, a lot of the benefits will go down to the poor. But even then, some people will be excluded. So the recommendation was aim for a 7% growth. That will take care of many people. But 20% of the people will still be left below the poverty line. And if you want to bring them above the poverty line, then you have to have some special programs that look after their interests. So that, in a way, is the beginning <coughs> of the idea <coughs> that growth has to be supplemented with other things. Let me get a glass of water. <coughs> You know, uh, initially, the thinking was simply that you need to give income to the poor so that they can have food to eat. But we we'll soon realized that, look, that is good, but what you really need is the state must do a lot more to develop what is called human capital. That is really quality of health, quality of education. I mean, growth doesn't take place just because you build factories. Growth takes place when the human capital, the quality of human capital improves, and then they use whatever investment is possible in order to generate more output. And you know, for a long time, India, India's performance was severely criticized on this ground. But I must say that Kerala was held out, particularly by the Nobel Prize winning author Amartya Sen, as the counter example. And his view was that, you know, he often said that Kerala may have a low growth rate, but it has a much higher level of human development, health education. And Sri Lanka was kind of similar. And Amartya used to go around the world saying that, look, uh, 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 don't be too bothered about the growth rate because they're doing so well in these dimensions. And one time I told him that, you know, you're being unnecessarily defensive about Kerala's growth rate because after the 1990s, Kerala actually had quite a good growth rate too. So he said, yeah, I hadn't looked at that, so next time I won't talk about this. But this was an interesting period because, I mean, I was as people were very kind to say, I was involved in the 91 reforms, and I used to go around peddling the reform story. Kerala was never convinced, by the way, that these reforms are good. But I should say that actually, uh, uh, intellectuals in Kerala misread the impact of the reforms. The reforms were actually very good for Kerala. One of the important reasons why they were very good is that they liberalized the exchange rate regime. So whereas earlier the rupee was kept low, 
for the benefit to keep industrial import cheap in India, which is not a good policy. And we changed it, brought in a more flexible exchange rate in the belief that this would actually create a more efficient industrialization. Kerala benefited from that because of the huge influx of remittances. Now, that didn't go to the government. It went to people. But the result was a boom in construction, lots of nice houses being produced, people coming back to visit their families, spending money here, restaurants increasing, employment increasing, etc., etc., etc. But it didn't lead to any factories being set up. That's true. But on the other hand, with the growth of education and the growth of demand for skilled labor, uh, Kerala youth, being better educated, found it easier to get jobs abroad. In the longer run, Kerala could be, and probably still now doing that, an important center for relocation of IT and promotion of research, etc., etc. Now, I say this really to draw home the point that, you know, at any given time, debates get, tend, tend to be so fixated on one thing that changes that are going to have a very positive effect 10 years down the road are just ignored. Uh, and right now, if you look at Kerala, uh, it would count amongst the, country, amongst the states which have a, both a high per capita income, per capita GDP, also much better social development. I mean, somebody has recently done a piece sort of characterizing different states. And the best ca category of state to be in is where your per capita GDP is high and your human development indicators are also high. And that's actually, Kerala is one of the four states of which that's true. There are many others where Human development is good, but per capita is not good. Uh, per capita is good, but human development is not good. And then, of course, there are a core of states where both are not good. That's a, a really tough position to be in. But Kerala is very well placed. And I think a lot of that has to do with the successful uh, resource, human resource development. And of course, this college is contributing to that. So you can all take a bit of pride uh, in that outcome. And I think that's a pointer to what we have to do ahead. You know, such a large proportion of India has low human development indicators that it is difficult to believe that we are going to achieve our objective of getting out of the middle-income group into the high-income group unless we fix this problem. So I think in some sense, you know, uh, we need a repurposing of the role of the state. And this is a continuation of the reforms of the 1990s. The state should not be interfering constantly in decisions that are best left to business. What is a good thing to produce? How to produce it? What technology to use, et cetera, et cetera. What the state ought to be doing is fulfilling its role in providing an environment in which there is peace and social stability, so everybody can concentrate on how to improve their lives, and also how to deliver good health care and good education. These are not things that can be done by the private sector. These are precisely the things that the state should do. And I think it's a fair criticism that we have tended to ignore these and we tend, on the other hand, to, uh, to do other kinds of things which are not necessarily, which the state is not necessarily good at. Now, why do we do that? I think this is where we have to go to the currency of politics. I mean, you, democratic government involves people appealing to uh, the electorate to vote them in and then sort of hopefully uh, getting an endorsement of what they've done and getting elected again. It is very difficult to go to the people and claim credit for these underlying things. Uh, it's much easier to claim credit for freebies that you give. So as a result, if you look across the country, 
uh, and I think it will be very interesting to see uh, what the different parties, and by the way, all parties, I think, uh, are guilty of this. To what extent are the different parties genuinely in a position of saying that, listen, government is a complicated thing, and we're going to provide an environment in which the basic things are getting taken care of, and as a result of that, the employment will grow, and as a result of that, you will have jobs, and if the growth is high enough, the wages will also rise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't find that anyone focuses on that. If the argument is employment, it's linked to reservation. Employment is low, what are you going to do for me or for my group? That is really, I mean, I realize that uh, politicians have to play uh, to the audience. I mean, that's the name of the game. But I think statesmanship therefore requires that you do what is necessary to win the vote, but deep down you've got to realize that what you're going to be remembered for is not the freebies. You're really going to be remembered for whether you did some of the things that transformed the economy and enable the economy to do a lot better. And right now, I would say that people are thinking of three or four things. Number one, build infrastructure. I think on that, uh, progress has been reasonably good in the last several years. We need to do a lot more, especially in some parts of the country, but I think on infrastructure development, I would say for the last 20 years, this has been taking place uh, in a reasonably good way uh, everywhere. Okay, but, but again, uh, when you're in a competitive world, it's not good enough to say things are better than they were. What people are looking at is, are they better than Vietnam? And I think on that we are not uh, anywhere near. So that's one part. Second is, are we doing enough on educating and health? Now frankly here, there's a lot of discussion on this. Most of that discussion concentrates on the fact that the government doesn't spend enough on education and health, which is, by the way, true. I mean, in India, the government, let's say, most people think that, um, you know, if you want a good health outcome in a country at our level, then you need to spend about 4% of GDP. Uh, and most people think that of that, 2% should be by the government and 2% should be out of pocket by the people. That clearly the 2% by the government should be covering a lot of free health for the poor. The 2% out of pocket will be covering better quality, etc., which the rich will want. So the government expenditure on health has to go up from 1% to at least 2%. Similarly, in education, <clears throat> we're not doing enough to produce quality education. I mean, uh, again, let's take China as a comparison. Uh, in India, research and development, the government is spending less than 1%, about 0.8% or so. In China, they spend 4%. Now, a lot of the problems that we have, raising agricultural productivity, uh, making it possible to produce things without pollution. Uh, all of this, better, better seeds for our crops, all of this is going to come from actually high quality research. Now, while it's true that the government is not spending enough, I don't think it follows that all we need to do is to increase government expenditure. Because the way it's spending it is equally important. And I think that this is something that is largely neglected, that if you, if you don't actually spend money well, uh, and just spend money, you will get a lot of kids in school, but they won't be learning very much. You know, Kerala is a very good example here also, because Kerala ha had much the best educational enrollment features of any of the other states. But you know, Kerala didn't rely on government schools. I mean, 50% of students in Kerala 
go to private and aided schools. Whereas the thrust elsewhere has been education is low, Amartya Sen says we must spend more money, therefore build more public school. And maybe you need to encourage a lot of more private schools which are aided and give them the money, they can do a better job of it. This is highly controversial. Whenever I give this lecture, if there are any school teachers present, they will completely disagree with what I'm saying. And they'll view it as some kind of uh, uh, undesirable uh, injection of foreign ideas. But it's not foreign ideas. There are, if, if in UP, people were to look at Kerala and say, what do these guys do that we're not doing? The answer would not be that they had more government schools. The answer would be that they had good schools. So the question is, what is it that makes for good schools? Now here, quite frankly, as an economist, I'm not qualified. And I, I find there's very little serious research being done in the country on how do we ensure that our kids get good quality education. And that's true not only in schools, but it's also true in universities. So you hear very often uh, business people saying that the graduates that we produce are not employable. You hear very often, on the other hand, people saying we must increase the enrollment rate in universities to 50%. It's not 50% even in Germany. So I think we need to know, if you want to produce a productive workforce, do you do that by pushing a whole lot of people into universities where they will do social sciences, history, geography, a few other things, get a degree of some sort, not be employable? Or isn't it better to create a really skilled workforce through a different kind of system where people work, go away, come back, re-educate themselves. This is a very big issue for the future. Because, you know, my generation grew up at a time when technology didn't change very much. Today, I mean, these young kids are growing up in a, gener in a generation where technology is changing rapidly. So anybody who graduated out of something 10 years ago there's no evidence that the person understands his own subject or her own subject today if they haven't gone back to get re-educated. And you know, the rise of technology is a major phenomenon around the world. People talk about AI and so on, but generally technology, digitalization, these are the things that are going to lead to uh, a more productive engagement of an educated population. This also has another implication, which is that, you know, the world of, uh, maybe the world of stable employment in a corporate job uh, is over. Uh, because what's going to happen is that functions are going to be unbundled. And while there will be stable employments in many companies, more and more things are going to be outsourced to people outside the company. So I think you, you, need, you need to train kids in that kind of world to cope with what, what are the real demand for services. I fear, on the other hand, that a lot of our pressure for education is driven by the belief that if you get educated, you'll get a government job. Now, if you look at most of the criticisms uh, governments get criticized that they haven't filled vacancies in government. It makes it look as if the reason they haven't filled the vacancies is because of absent-mindedness. That's not true. The reason they haven't filled the vacancies is that the state governments don't have the money and don't want to take on people on a permanent job. They prefer to hire temporary staff paid very little but they're able to give some sort of a lecture and you basically can pay salaries. So, you know, this is the linkage between, on the one hand, state governments being pushed into spending more and, money on, more and more money on freebies, and on the other hand, the budget being constrained, and the only way they can react is to squeeze expenditure, which boils down to either not paying salaries 
or not filling vacancies in health and education. So these are all interlinked in a way. And there's no question that the solution to these problems has to come from faster growth because it's the faster growth that will generate the revenues that will enable the system to function. But a politics in which a lot of the revenues generated leak out immediately into freebies is not a politics that's going to lead to de delivery by the government of the things that are really the job of the government. I think the, this is one of the key things, uh, and I'm not sure how we can solve the problem, but I just feel younger people, when they get a chance to ask politicians questions, should question in, uh, them on these things. You know, otherwise it's very easy to please people by saying, I've got this scheme, I've got the other scheme, etc. It's the policies which actually determine uh, how the economy is going to be, not these individual little programs. Now, let me touch on uh, one, other, uh, one other fact. I mean, two other factors. One is that increasingly, uh, people are now saying that, look, the GDP metric doesn't work because it doesn't address the question of what's happening to inequality. Now, inequality is very different from poverty because you can have a, you can have a model in which there's enough flowing down so that what you call the poor are getting some support. But the rest of the income is highly concentrated. And around the world, the rise of inequality has become an issue. And that's true of the United, uh, Western countries, it's true of China, it's also true of India. You know, I do think that uh, my personal view is that the, 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 the re reducing the poverty level is much more important than fighting inequality by itself. Second, for a country like India, which is developing and new industries are coming up, and the skilled people are more mobile in the globe, some increase in inequality is actually unavoidable. I mean, if you're going to have skilled people who can get a job abroad, the only way you're going to keep them here is by offering them not exactly the same amount, but better than we're doing today. And this means that those who have jobs that command uh, a demand globally are likely to have a faster rise in wages than the purely unskilled. I mean, the solution is to have more people in this category, which is what lies up, ties up with education. But one consequence of that is that inequality will increase. But you know, extreme inequality, I mean, the focus today around the world is not on whether the share of the top 20% has gone up or not gone up. It has. The, share, it, the worry is the share of the top one-tenth of the top one percent has gone up hugely. And I think this is something that we also uh, need to worry about. What we can do about it requires much deeper thinking. Uh, certainly, shutting off the, to trends in the world does not make sense. Preventing our people from emigrating doesn't make sense either. Uh, but how do we cope? I mean, how do we cope with the fact that if you're running a university and you want to have a first-class finance department, then the truth is the market price for a highly qualified finance professional is much higher than, let's say, for a highly qualified teacher of uh, Hindi or some other uh, more common subject. Are we in a position to introduce differences in professorial salaries so that we can get good quality people in these scarce disciplines? I mean, if you want to teach AI and you want to have a good quality person teaching AI, you have to pay that person more than what you pay the professor of poetry or the professor of history. But you know, in a university, it's very difficult to make this point because universities also have a, a tradition of uh, equality. And this is something where European universities differ from American universities. American universities have no problems. Now, the interesting thing is the Chinese also have no problem. I mean, I remember going to Beijing way back in 2010, I think. 
And I asked our ambassador, then Mr. Jayashankar, who's now our external affairs minister, I said, I'd like to talk to someone in the Tsinghua University uh, to learn how are they getting all these, pro they had a thousand scholars program. And they just said that, look, we want to get a thousand Chinese scholars from abroad to come back to China and teach, uh, because we want to improve the quality of our education. And it seemed to me that we could do the same thing, because we have an equal number of scholars abroad. So I asked him, how do you do it? He said, it's very simple. He said, first, we decided what are the subjects we want to upgrade. So we're not interested in Chinese history. We're not interested in economics. We're not interested in geography. That is being taught and well enough. But we're interested in these scientific disciplines where China wants to take a lead. Then we make a list of who are the Chinese scholars in each discipline which fall at the very top. Then we approached them and said, look, you want to come to China? Uh, and we negotiate the salary they want. I mean, they're willing to take a cut from their American salaries, but they won't come on Chinese salaries. So I said, but how, how do you bring them back? In the, don't the local professors object that here is this Johnny come lately, and he's getting twice my salary, and I've been working hard. And many of them would say that we were in the same class together. It's just that he went to America, et cetera, et cetera. And he said to me, Mr. Alwalia, you have to learn to distinguish a dragon from a fish. Now, you know, this is a very kind of um, frank acceptance that some things you just have to do. Whether we are able to do it or not is a really big question. I don't think that we are, I mean, none of our state universities can do that because they are guided by, I mean, a professor has a certain salary and that's it. Uh, but we need to think. If we really believe that our universities at the moment do not have the best talent, what is the solution? Uh, so some of these questions are, I mean, they are, they're, not, they're not politically sensitive in terms of high politics, because they're sensitive to all p political parties. But yet if they don't actually address the issue, uh, it's not going to be the case that they'll solve the problem. Let me, in the last few minutes that I may have, uh, talk a bit about climate change, because that's something I've personally been taking a lot of interest in. <clears throat> and frankly, it is an area now where people in India are aware that climate change is happening. I mean, we see that in our own personal experience. You saw what happened in Chennai as a result of the floods. There would be other examples that you can give about Kerala, virtually every state there are examples of extreme events which lead to all kinds of consequences. And you know, the current science says that if the global warming continues to take place, uh, let me say that we have, as a result of international agreements, all countries have taken some steps. So it's not the case that the world is hurtling towards destruction without doing anything. What is the case is the world knows that destruction is there and it's not doing enough. The good news is it's doing something, but it's not doing enough. The question arises, what is required to somehow prevent that? Now, two, two issues come up. One is no country individually can address the climate change issue because it is the global emissions of GAGs that leads to global warming. So therefore, everybody has to get together and do it. Equally, there's a very strong temptation to free ride. That is, you could legitimately say, the best thing for you is if everybody agrees to do it and you don't do it. Because what you don't do saves you a lot of costs. But the benefits of what would have ha happened if you had incurred those costs would not have come to you. They'd have gone to everybody. So best thing is to get everyone to do it and not do it yourself. I don't think this is going to work. I mean, countries will be forced to demonstrate their seriousness. So in India, that really means that, for example, 
massive increase in um, investment in renewable energy, most of which will have to come from the private sector. But as long as our state electricity distribution companies are as broke as they are, nobody's going to invest in them. Uh, the only way people are investing in them is that the state governments are giving guarantees. That is only making the implicit debt problem worse. We just have to stop loss-making public sector-owned discounts. Now that means realizing that the extent to which you can give free electricity is limited. I mean, of course, you can target some groups. I would even say that, you know, you're better off giving a direct cash subsidy to identified groups that you need to give cash subsidies to. But the idea that you can somehow avoid everybody paying a higher cost of electricity, if you're forced otherwise to go to more expensive ways of generating electricity, is simply not viable. Similarly, in the area of water, we have a huge water scarcity problem. I mean, the water we have is the same as it was when the population was 250 million. It's now 1.4 billion. And it's not just the people drinking water and the kind of bathing and so on. It's the water that you need to produce the things that these people consume, not just agriculture, but also industry. That water is today not priced. I mean, you pay the cost of pulling it out from under the ground. But the use of water itself as a scarce commodity, there's no royalty on water, for example. And you get the most absurd, uh, Kerala is better off in this respect, because you have a lot of water, you have a lot of hydro, so congratulations. You should f count this as a blessing. Really it is. But you know, there are parts of the country like Maharashtra, which are very parched. And you know, 60% of the water that Maharashtra has is devoted to 4% of the area, which is what grows uh, sugarcane. Now, frankly, given, the, and, and the same thing is true of Tamil Nadu, where they're growing sugarcane. You know, if water were properly priced, there would be a huge structural change. A lot of people wouldn't be growing what they're growing now. Now, this brings me to a subject again, which is a bit nostalgic, because the last time I was lecturing in Kerala, many years ago, I made the point that, you know, I don't understand why governments in Kerala absolutely insist that Kerala should be self-sufficient in rice. I mean, simply because as the system evolves and productivity in Bihar and other places increases, they will keep supplying rice very cheap. And if you support the food distribution system, and Kerala is the biggest supporter of the food distribution system, you're actually encouraging the government of India to buy all this rice from outside and dump it at virtually zero price today in Kerala. Who do you think you're hurting? You're hurting the Kerala rice farmer because he's actually denied the demand, which is a natural demand for him. So at the same time, you don't want him to convert into growing something else. I mean, it makes sense in such a situation to diversify. You can grow cashew, you can grow spices, cloves, cardamom, you name it. And our cardamom is much better than Guatemalan cardamom. But marketing-wise, those guys are wiping us out. So I think change involves structural change, but accepting structural change is a huge problem. And this is typically, it becomes a political problem. Uh, and I mean, I have to say, we have the same problem in Punjab. Uh, for some reason, we have got hooked onto this wheat rice rotation. Wheat is a good crop for Punjab, but rice is an exceptionally bad crop. It's a very water intensive crop, and Punjab doesn't have water. So, as a result, they're pumping water from under the ground, pressurizing the government to give the electricity free and slowly lowering the water table. Uh, and I've discussed this when I was in government with several chief ministers of different parties. And they would all say, yes, yes, what you're saying is right, but we can't do anything about it. 
Now, you know, climate change is going to pose many, many challenges. It will force us to do things differently. And frankly, most people hope that these young children here will translate their awareness of the seriousness of a problem into a citizen willingness to take some of the tough decisions needed. Because if that doesn't happen, then quite frankly, I don't see the problem of climate change being adequately handled. So these are some of the issues. I mean, we, we need to grow at 8%. We need to generate more employment. We can do that if we can improve the quality of our education. That requires the government to rethink how to improve the quality of education. And it requires an acceptance that structural change is unavoidable. We are not going to become a high-income country with the same economic structure that we have today. In fact, the whole point about becoming a high-income country is a structure of demand changes. And the, the system must support that changing structure. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. It's a great pleasure being here. And I do hope you will go into the Wikipedia and edit the Cardinal Joseph Parakatil entry over there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Montek Singh Aluwalias is a name my generation repeatedly learned in school textbooks and came across in newspapers as a person who is at the helm of an institution that shaped the backbone of modern Indian economy. It's been an honor and pleasure for Bharat Mata College to listen to you, sir. And we move on to the interactive part of today's exercise, which is something the speaker himself looks forward to. And I request the audience to enrich today's session by bringing on their questions and comments. I also request the audience to phrase their questions brief and precise so that we have enough time to accommodate more questions. The forum is now open to discussion. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your very kind comments. I mean, those thanks not to me, but to that whole team of people who brought about the change. And I think this is a very important point that, you know, uh, my dominant recollection of the 90s is there were a lot of people willing to work together to bring about the change. It wouldn't have happened if it was just one person, even at the political level. You know, on the question of globalization, you know, there is this, this fear that if we globalize, we become uh, victims of some huge global multinational corporation. Now, the rise of multilateral, multilateral co corporations is a, is a phenomenon everywhere. And even in the United States, people are feeling that, you know, Google is too big and uh, all these other Instagram and what have you. And by the way, that's a very, it's a philosophically uh, important question. I'm currently reading 
a rather nice book by this Israeli author uh, uh, Yuval Harari, uh, Homo Deus. He did one called Homo Sapiens. His latest book is Homo Deus. And I tell you, it, 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 it presents a very disturbing picture of what new technology, uh, which is going to be monopolized by a few people, I mean, the two to go together, because if there were many, then they would all operate against each other, but the nature of the technology is that uh, winner takes all, and you get these giant corporations that squeeze out everybody else. And he even says that, look, uh, you know, you no longer know what you really believe. I mean, in the sense that, uh, you know, he describes, it's interesting because he describes the change from uh, earlier times when basically values were determined by religion. And then you had the liberal liberalism, which sort of interact and sort of said, look, values are not determined by what is said in any scripture, values are determined by whatever the human uh, desire, and so that's kind of humanism, if you like. It's sort of belief that humans know what is good, and you want something because you know you want it, and that gives you uh, a certain special separateness and a uniqueness, and that's the kind of, you know, consumer is right type of uh, approach. But I think what he argues is that uh, uh, modern technology is actually coming around to the view that you don't do something because you actually want to do it, some mythical thing called you. It's actually the biological algorithms within your system which tell you how to behave. So actually you are just a multiplicity of algorithms. And then the danger is that AI is going to be a better algorithm simply because it can process a hell of a lot more data than you can. And that's where the taking over by AI <clears throat> philosophically is a matter of concern. Now at a much lower level, uh, are we worried about multinationals? You know, human society should worry about excessively large corporations uh, kind of m managing to manipulate uh, social perceptions. But I don't think we should be any more worried about global corporations than our own corporations. So the anti-corporation view is something different from globalization. I don't think the solution to this is to shut off technology, prevent our guys from using this technology, and then keep the foreign multinationals out. I think we have to have access to whatever technology is, and we have to, in a social and political sense, take on that challenge, and more importantly, actually be aware of it. Uh, I'm now going beyond my competence, because I, as I said, I just started thinking about this when I read Noval, Noah Yuval Harari's book, or is it Yuval Noah Harari's book? So I'm not, I'm not an expert. But I think this is what I meant by the world around us is changing, and we need to be aware of that change, and we need to think about it. Stopping globalization because it prevents you from being victimized by multinational corporations, I don't think is the way to go. Uh, I, I think uh, we should allow more globalization, I would say that, you know, when you're competing with very large fellows, then maybe your own industry does need some support. And there's no doubt that they don't compete in a free market. But, you know, uh, the United States funds a huge amount of research. That research has become available for everybody. We are not doing it that way. We, we want to fund individual corporations. Maybe some of these fundings are justified, it's become more complicated. But I don't think the problem is globalization. Remember, the United States is very concerned about globalization because it threatens its primary position. 
as long as it didn't threaten its primary position and helped its corporations to expand, it was in favor of globalization. The Chinese have decided to threaten the US and they have explicitly said, we threaten your technological leadership, we threaten your military position, and we also threaten you as a way of life. And they have got themselves into a position. If they were just threatening the way of life by lectures, I don't think the US would worry. But what they're saying is that we are going to be ahead of you in AI, which is a dominant technology of the future. And the fact that they've taken a technological lead is encouraging the United States to deny them the benefits of globalization. Now, we are nowhere in that position. It doesn't make sense for us to shut off globalization. We may not be in a position to um, challenge the multinationals on their own terms. But what is happening today is those very multinationals are doing a lot of the research in India. I think there are, what, hundreds, several thousands of engineers in Bangalore and other places doing the research that these multinationals need. That, of course, means that the, since they're getting them very cheap, they make most of the profit through their IPR. But the benefit to us is that we have, I don't know if it's 20,000 or 30,000, but we have engineers working at the cutting edge of AI. So as and when some company decides to put some money into it, they will have a ready pool of highly skilled engineers whom they can hire in order to compete with these very same companies. So shutting, shutting them out is not at all a solution. But watching carefully how do we get the best deal out of it, that requires some careful thinking. Very important and very difficult question. So let me just uh, share a few thoughts on those, okay? First, the question of whether the informal sector has been badly hit. Uh, I think it has. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion also that, you know, the recovery that we've seen is actually a K-shaped recovery. That is, the better parts of the system have recovered and the weaker parts have got left down. You know, the if you go back six or seven years, uh, the informal sector or the MSMEs, you know, the category MSME is very misleading because at one end it includes sort of micro enterprises which just have two people working. At the other end it can include uh, people with well over 500. I think one of the problems in India is that uh, structurally, we have had too many micro enterprises. Uh, and as the system changed, uh, it was inevitable that these very, very micro enterprises would become smaller in number and the people employed in it would go into the other enterprises, small enterprises, middle enterprises, 
which are expanding. Now, you know, if we had had a steady growth rate, this process would have happened without too many problems. Instead, we had a sharp interruption. Uh, I know that, well, demonetization was one. GST is very often blamed. Uh, you know, net, 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 I think, although GST could have been handled better, the basic idea of a GST is actually sound. And I think associated with the GST is the notion of formalization. It will drive more and more enterprises into the formal sector, and that will bring them into the tax net. Quite a few of the small enterprises were actually surviving because of tax arbitrage. Now, fine, you know, if you can do it, you do it. But over time, that has to fade out. The real problem is we had a big shock, and that in any set of uh, systems, if you have a big shock, the informal guys are least able to withstand that shock. So the pandemic, which led to a huge decline, would have hugely exacerbated the problems of the informal sector. But uh, I mean, you have to treat that as a once and for all, not once and for all, but a once in so many years event and look at what the ha what's happening now. You know, people tell me that the GST, uh, in terms of revenue yield, is now beginning to show an improvement, which means that the smaller enterprises are also paying. Certainly, uh, um, bringing into the system the kind of digital uh, awareness and cap capability that you need to comply with the GST is a burden. And people should be helped in order to uh, achieve that. For the rest, I think what the small scale sector needs is rapid growth in GDP. I mean, if they succeed in getting 8% 8, 8 growth back, there's no doubt that the small scale sector will also benefit. Part of the problem also, by the way, is that, you know, um, what you might call informal jobs. When the economy was booming, everybody thought Zomato is wonderful, it gives flexibility, people can earn living, etc., and so on. The moment you had a downturn, everybody said this is terrible because there's no social security. All of that is true. But my guess is that uh, if we can succeed in getting good growth, many of the problems that you see at present in the small sales sector will uh, subside. But it's quite possible that the very large number of very small enterprises that we had uh, are not going to survive. And the people will redeploy themselves elsewhere. Uh, that will be painful, uh, but I don't see an alternative. Because if you look at, look at the structure, uh, it's phenomenal how many, uh, how many enterprises in India uh, were surviving with less than 10 workers. Almost 90% of the employment is in that category. And that's, that's a wrong structure. A lot of it should be moved higher up. Because social, <coughs> social security and worker protection can only be ensured if more and more of the companies are large enough to provide it. So there's a bit of a tension there. I don't know if this sounds credible, but you know, <laughs> It's, it's a sensitive issue, uh, and there no doubt, I have no doubt that they're going through a tough time. Part of the problem there, by the way, also, is the banking system. I mean, the banks are no longer giving credit to production enterprises. They're giving credit to, on personal loans. Even that could run into a problem, because what you're seeing is a young population that has got used to rising salaries, IT professionals, etc., and they're all having a consumption boom. They're buying cars on EMIs, they're buying houses on EMIs. A lot of people feel that it's got a bit overdone. So as and when the banks find that these are not necessarily uh, very good loans, they may begin to shift a little bit more towards uh, finding good medium and small scale enterprises to lend to. But you know, lending, remember, lending is only a support of expected productivity. 
I mean, if you're badly hit and you want a loan in order to consume, have your daily bread, then that's a temporary thing. I mean, then you, you either get out of that business or it's not viable. So not every, ba not every small enterprise will get bank loans. Banks now have the benefit of fintechs, which enable them to analyze the data of individuals and make a judgment that who's the most likely uh, to be a good banking risk. So some of this will come back, but not, not to everybody. Well, no, I mean, that's a... Uh, uh, can be done in one lecture. You give me some time and I'll come back and have a more discussion. But you know, the, the truth is we, we always simplify things by saying that this happened and then everything is because of that. There's a much more complex change going on. My only point is that I would not attribute the problems of the small scale sector to the process of opening up the economy or liberalization. Because the fact is that in many, many dimensions, uh, the small-scale sector also benefited from the economic reforms. And during a certain period, they were themselves saying that, look, we're doing quite well. Okay? The problem is that when things go badly, they really get badly hit. So you have to, you have to let the system recover, and they have to rely on whatever reserves they have stay in the game, and when the economy gets back into shape, maybe they'll be able to do as well as they think they can. That's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think it's well known that both the center and the state subs have subscribed under the fiscal discipline, management, whatever, uh, to a time path for the fiscal deficit, which would, in, in effect, end up reducing the debt burden, okay? Uh, so the proposition that they shouldn't, both the center and the states are currently borrowing much more than the fiscal responsibility glide path indicated. Now, um, they justified that because of the pandemic, uh, uh, the COVID-19, unusual circumstances. Now we're getting back to normal. 
uh, will they get back? Will the central government get back to a, a tighter fiscal deficit? We have to wait and see. And you can't tell from the coming budget, that's an interim budget, so it's, it's the government that's in power after the election that will decide that. But you're right that that will be a very relevant question to ask the future finance minister, that what is your target for the fiscal deficit? You know, the government borrowing that the, any government does is essentially the fiscal deficit. The fiscal deficit is what adds to the debt because it's not covered by any revenue, uh, revenue receipts that you've got. If they were to bring the, if the central government brings the fiscal deficit down to 3%, uh, and the state governments are held to say 2.5%, you'll see a change. Now, if the central government doesn't do it, then of course the states will say that, look, you're not obeying your own guidelines, why are you restricting us? That's a legitimate, legitimate point. But if the state government were to say, look, I don't want to accept my whatever, two and a half percent, then basically the central government has ways of preventing them from borrowing. Uh, only thing is it will lead to uh, enforced fiscal discipline on the state. And this will lead to the whole question of are you treating all states equally, et cetera. I mean, you can't be favoring one state category of states and not favoring the other. But you know, fiscal, I, I think on the fiscal discipline issue, there's really no debate uh, at the national level in the sense that nobody that I know says that no, both the center and the state should be encouraged to borrow more and more. They all say that they should both be controlled. Now the question is, will they live by that? You have to wait and see. I mean, I can't predict what they'll do. But a state government cannot by itself borrow more than what is laid down under the fiscal rules because there's this, there's this central, the Reserve Bank of India, which manages their debt, can start saying, look, this is too much. They're not prepared to support such a huge borrowing. Then the state government usually gets other state entities to borrow. But the financial system knows that these borrowings are based on state government guarantees. And if they're doing a good job, they should basically not support such borrowings because they are not based on a financially viable system. But unfortunately, we have too much of our financial system is subject to political control. So these signals are not going out. I'm not saying now, they've never gone out. I mean, otherwise, quite frankly, not all states are in a bad position. Uh, some states are in a much better position. And if the debt market functioned well, the interest rate paid by those states would be much better than the interest rate paid by states whose fiscal position is bad. But historically, our Reserve Bank and all have always tried to avoid too much difference in the rate of interest paid on different state loans. And that can't be a permanent feature, quite honestly. From the global? No, no, I think since 91, we are not insulated. Look, the usual measure of insulation is uh, exports of goods and services a percent of GDP. And it's been rising. In the last two, three years, the present government raised import duties, so it's gone down a bit. I hope that's temporary. But there's no doubt that compared to 91, we are much more integrated with the global economy, including on the financial side. I mean, a lot of your stock market, etc., depends on global flows, which keep stock, stock prices high. Yes?
Well, that, no, I, I mean, uh, uh, it's true that if a, I mean, if a state government doesn't provide the kind of environment that you need for good development, then people will migrate out, either to other states or abroad. If they can go abroad, they'll go abroad. If they can migrate to other states where the environment is better, they'll go there. But you know, in the longer term, uh, the solution doesn't lie in stopping this. The solution lies in asking state governments, why are you not providing the kind of environment in which people would want to migrate from other states to here rather than the other way around? But you are not in serious danger of migration into the rest of the country, but you're in danger of migration abroad. But you know, if you've produced high quality human resources and they're getting more money outside, I wouldn't resent that too much. It's giving you, giving you international exposure. In the long run, it may well be better. But certainly, certainly you should, we should be ensuring that the quality of life within the state improves. Okay? We apologize to the audience for having to wrap up this very interesting and meaningful session for want of time. I thank the audience for their point on questions and the speaker for his elaborate thought out answers. We shall move on with the rest of the program for the day. Thank you, Dr. Rose for moderating the interactive session. It was indeed interesting to listen to an erudite like Honorable Montek Singh Aluwalia and I request Reverend Dr. Vargi Spotekil to kindly honor the keynote speaker of the day by handing over a token of our love and gratitude. So please receive the same. Thank you. And now it's a distribution of Cardinal Joseph Pare Cardinal Excellence Award. And I invite Dr. Shibi Thomas from the Department of Physics to coordinate the same. Cardinal Joseph Pare Cardinal Excellence Award is a prestigious honor instituted by Bharat Mada College Trikakara to commemorate our founder, Cardinal Mar Joseph Pare Cardinal. Every year, this award is bestowed upon outstanding students and faculty members for their excellence. Here we conquer this esteemed award for the academic year 2023. Now I invite our honorable chief guest, Mondek Singh Aliwalia, to present the mementos to the awardees. Sir, please. Let me first call upon the faculty members who have excelled in their respective departments. Department of BBA, Dr. Shibi B. <laughs> Department of Commerce, Dr. Pony Joseph. Department of Commerce, Dr. Nimmi A. George. <laughs> Department of Computer Application, Dr. Anusri M. <laughs> Department of Computer Application, Dr. Kala A. Department of Computer Science, Dr. John T. Abraham. <laughs> Department of Economics, Dr. Nidhin Thomas. <laughs> Department of English, Dr. Lissy Kachapalli. <laughs> 
Department of Malayalam, Dr. Thomas Vergis. Institute of Management, Dr. Bichai Joseph. <laughs> Department of Mathematics, Dr. Joby McCollil. <laughs> Department of Physics, Dr. Manish Michael. Department of Social Works, Dr. Elsa Mary Jacob. <laughs> Department of Taxation, Dr. Aldrin Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Next, I invite our Dear Father, Reverend Dr. Vargis Potegel, to present the mementos to the students. Let me call upon the students who have excelled in their respective departments. Department of BBA, Ms. Alita Vargis. <laughs> Department of Botany, Ms. Dilsha Siddiq. Department of Chemistry, postgraduate level, Ms. Rosemaria T. Pohl. <laughs> Department of Chemistry, undergraduate level, Ms. Dia Fatima. <laughs> Department of Commerce, Postgraduate level, Ms. Anju G.K. <laughs> Department of Commerce, undergraduate level, Mr. Aromel Sajeevan. <laughs> Department of Computer Application, Ms. Sneha Chandriga Anil. Department of Economics, Mr. Joyvin Vergis. <laughs> Department of English, postgraduate level, Mr. Nevin Manarden. <laughs> Department of English, undergraduate level, Ms. Angel K. Benny. Department of Malayalam, Sister Aghila Joseph. In her absence, Sister Lima FCC is receiving the award. Institute of Management, Ms. S. Renjini. <laughs> Department of Marketing, Ms. Jennifer Julius. Department of Mathematics, Ms. Anna Maria Sajan. <laughs> Department of Physical Education, Mr. Jerry M. John. <laughs> Department of Physics, Model 1, Mr. Balakrishna M. S. Department of Physics, Model 2, Mr. Ogin Joe. <laughs> Department of Physics, Postgraduate Level, Ms. Jisra TK. <laughs> Department of Taxation, Batch 1, 
Ms. Milna Roy. Department of Taxation Batch 2, Ms. Swati Suraj. Department of Travel and Tourism, Ms. Mitty Sigha. And Department of Zoology, Ms. Sweda Shiva Subramanya here. Thank you, Father. I extend heartfelt congratulations to all the award winners and express our gratitude to their proud parents for their punctual arrival and cooperation in receiving the awards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shibi and team. And now we are coming to the close of the formal meeting, and I invite the convener of today's event, Dr. Pony Joseph, who has been working relentlessly for the successful conduct of today's program to propose the word of thanks. Respected manager, Reverend Dr. Abraham Oliapurath, Principal Dr. K. M. Johnson, sir, the Vigar General of Ernagulam Angamali Archdiocese, Reverend Dr. Vagis Potekel, esteemed Chief Guest, Dr. Monding Singh Aluwalia, Assistant Manager, Reverend Father Jimichan Karatanam, Vice Principals, Dr. Lisi Kachapuli and Ms. Bini Rani Rose, Retired teachers, other invited guests, Parekatil Excellence Award winners, dear colleagues, non-teaching staff, students, and all other well-wishers. I stand here before you with a great pride and pleasure as we conclude the 20th Cardinal Joseph Parekatil Commemorative Lecture 2023-24. It's an honor and a great privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this special occasion. Our 20th commemorative lecture has been a celebration of enduring legacy of Mar Cardinal Joseph Parekatil, a distinguished figure in the academic world and a source of inspiration for many. Today, we gather to remember his remarkable contributions and to honor the impact he left on the academic community. Greatness can indeed be a way of life and Cardinal Parekatil exemplified this through his dedication and divine grace. His legacy is not only a testament to his time but also a beacon for the future. In this special occasion, we are blessed to have our esteemed chief guest, Dr. Monding Singh Aluwalia, for gracing us with his presence. Your insightful keynote address on the challenges ahead for India has truly inspired us. Your distinguished career as an economist and civil servant, coupled with the prestigious Padma Vibhushan Award, is a testament to your outstanding contributions to economic policy and public service. I express our heartfelt gratitude to you, sir. <laughs> a special thanks to our Reverend Dr. Vergis Potekel, the Vigar General of Ernagulam Angamali Archdiocese, for taking the time from, the, from his busy schedule to be with us reflecting the importance and attachment to Bharat Mada community. Thank you, Father, for gracing us with your esteemed presence. <laughs> Heartfelt thanks are extended to our esteemed manager, Reverend Father Dr. Abraham Oliyapurat, for the unwavering support, autonomy, and facilities provided for organizing such kind of events on campus, notably today's Cardinal Pare Kadil Talk. Thank you, dear father. 
Acknowledgements are out to our principal, Dr. K. M. Johnson, sir, for being an unwavering source of motivation and guiding force in our endeavor and efforts to excel in the field of education. Thank you, sir. My appreciation also goes to our assistant manager, Reverend Father Jimmy Chan Karthanam, for the constant su support and guidance. Thank you, dear father. <laughs> Vice principals, Dr. Lissi Kachapalima and Bini Rani Rosma, your vibrant and dynamic presence is highly appreciated. Thank you for being a constant pillars and support for the institution. My gratitude extends to all our retired teachers, invited guests, and all other well-wishers who accepted our invitation and making this event gathering of pleasant and responsible individuals. Thank you all. <laughs> Hearty congratulations to all the Cardinal Parekatal Excellence Awardees, and thank you so much for being an integral part of this special occasion. And a special thanks to uh, my BMC team, their colleagues, technical and supporting team, non-teaching staff, students for your cooperation, teamwork and contributions that made this function a great success. <laughs> Above all, I extend my sincere thanks to Almighty God for making today's event a resounding success. With his blessings and grace, we were able to make this event what it was. Once again, thank you all for gracing us with our invaluable time, wishing each one of you a splendid journey ahead. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Ponni. And we have come to the end of the formal meeting. And let's rise for the national anthem before dispersing for the lunch. Janagana mana adhina ayaka jaya he Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Utkala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladhi Taranga Tavashubha Name Jage शुभ आशीष मांगे गाहे तब जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे Thank you everyone. Food is arranged here. So serve yourself and have a great time. Thank you.